So let me introduce Tegan. Tegan Sinman is a PhD candidate at the Erasmus School of Law in Rotterdam at the Netherlands. She was an intern at the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights Treaty Capacity Building Program. And prior to that, she obtained both her LLB and LLM degrees from the University of uh, Stellenbosch in South Africa. Tegan's research areas include public international law, international human rights law, with specific focus on intersectional human rights protection, gender, religion, the formation and function of identity, as well as progressive treaty interpretation. Um, Tegan will present her paper on recognizing gender identity as an internationally protected group against hate speech. Tegan, the floor is yours. So, hi everyone, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I feel a little bit like an outlier with the topic, but I'm really excited to have the space to present it. Um, as a disclaimer, um, I'm currently doing my PhD, I'm in my first year, and this is kind of a side project that isn't actually related to my, my current research. It, it's related, but it, it's not the main topic. So I'm very grateful to have a space to be working on this paper, uh, just out of personal interest. So uh, yeah, so today I'm gonna be talking about recognizing gender identity as an internationally protected ground against hate speech. Um, I'm very excited to discuss the paper with you more so than have to present any concrete thing. So um, as an introduction, the context of my research has mostly been, I'm very new with studying hate speech per se um, and speech regulation in general. And so I have more of a background looking at kind of anti-discrimination law and the protection of queer people in general. So people based on their sexual orientation or gender identity, things like that. Um, and so the context that I was looking at the paper um, is kind of the context that transgender people are in the world today. So their experiences of discrimination, of violence, hate speech against them. And so with opportunity to focus on hate speech today, I focused on looking at hate speech specifically and how it contributes to kind of the climate and viol uh, of violence and discrimination against trans people. Um, so <clears throat> just to, I always like to start with, um, a terminology for a lot of us in law and international law, uh, speaking about maybe gender or things like that is kind of iffy. So I like to sort of set out at least where I'm coming from. Um, so people know what we're saying if I talk about gender identity as a protected ground. So to start, um, when I talk about gender identity as a protected ground for discrimination, gender identity can be defined as one's personal experience of their gender, one's deeply personal, uh, private experience, and then we can publicize that of how we dress, how we speak, and what we identify as. So um, that then relates for understanding what a transgender person is or who a transgender person is, and that is somebody who, um, whose gender identity is different from their biological birth sex. So in contrast to somebody who's cisgender, as an example, I'm cisgender, so my biological birth sex um, was female, is female, and I also identify as a woman, so I'm cisgender. A transgender person is somebody whose gender identity and birth sex do not correlate. So their birth sex and um, how they identify is now, well, is different, probably has always been different, um, but this is also an umbrella term to talk about non-binary people, gender non-conforming people. It's not always in the binary sense of somebody who was born male and now identifies as female. There's a lot of diversity to it, and, and I wanna look at that. Um, also in saying this, both cisgender and transgender people have gender identities. We all do. As all people have a race, we all have that. So also when I'm talking today about protected grounds, I'm talking more to look at um, hate speech based on gender identity targeting transgender people. So not targeting cisgender people. Um, I want to just clarify then also that as we understand sexual orientation is more our sexual practices, our attractions, who we date, who we are interested in romantically, um, who we have sex with, and that is different from our gender identities. We have both of them at the same time, and sometimes they correlate and sometimes they don't. So transgender people have the same a range of um, sexual orientations as cis people do. So you could be trans and you could be gay, you could be trans and lesbian, you could be trans and bi, you could be trans and straight, and the diversity of humanity is amazing. This is important for a bit I talk about later in, in the context. Um, and then, yeah, just to relate it, if we talk about this gender identity is where your gender and sex um, uh, distinguish or relate, gender is kind of more the, the cultural and social construction with how we comprehend our identity, and sex is more related to our biological features of our body, so our chromosomes, our hormones, our internal and external reproductive structures. 
things like that. Um, and then the concept in which this whole paper was written and the way I, I am considering the world is through considering heteronormativity and its impact on people's ability to be recognized as legal subjects. So heteronormativity um, enforces the assumption that all persons are and all persons should be straight, cisgender, and compliant within the gender binary. So heteronormativity isn't only potentially harmful for trans people, it's harmful for gay people, it's harmful for anybody who doesn't potentially act in the way that we assume a good man, a good woman, a good person does. Um, Related to hate speech, then, is also the concept of transphobia. So as we have heard phobia used as other terms, we have homophobia, we have Islamophobia, we have it. So it's transphobia in the sense, fear, aversion, disgust, hatred of people who do not conform to gender expectations. Um, trans bashing is a term that we kind of have used as well, which is directly relatable. Um, and then just as another term, because I used throughout, uh, gender ideology is something that is in as a term being increasingly used, you could say particularly on the far right kind of religious movements, um, it's seen as this conspiracy theory that through the education of gender and the critique of gender and considering what it is to us as a society, there's kind of this, this moral conspiracy to, I don't know, um, undermine society. So we see a lot of this being used in certain um, places in the United States, in Eastern Europe, in African countries, etc. So that's kind of just a framework for the for the terms that I'll use throughout and where I'm coming from. So then I'm super grateful that Elena was before me because I'm very grateful that I won't have all the time to go through the international law framework. So I'll kind of reiterate stuff she already set up. Um, but obviously hate speech then is a question of freedom of speech and where can we restrict it? What's the line if there is one? Um, so so free speech or the principle of freedom of speech indicates all people are free to express themselves, including their thoughts, opinions, without restraint, fear of censorship or legal sanction. So I like to often describe it as protected speech, but in a negative formulation. So your, your speech is free, it's protected in a negative formulation because no state will interfere with you and your ability to speak. So in international human rights law, Article 19 of the uh, Universal Declaration is our nice like soft law, declaration it's not binding but it kind of defines it for us it's great and then the ICCPR in article 19 1 and 2 set out the right in a bit more detail and set it up for us so when thinking about the overlap of hate speech and then a protected ground for hate speech we talk about speech regulation um, and so article 22 Elena spoke about a little bit earlier which I'm very grateful for and that sets out that any advocacy of national, racial, religious hatred that constitute incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence shall be prohibited by law. So this, this is a, a treaty um, article that encourages states, that mandates states on this basis to, and this is to, to prohibit, um, but this is the inciting speech kind of thing. And this is where the rabbit plan of action is relevant. We have a threshold, right? Uh, clearly, gender identity is, is not listed there, so we'll get to that, but just to bear it in mind, a little bit more wider, um, and not a prohibition, but a restrictions clause, is then Article 19.3, so that follows on from the definition we already had, and this is can be known as the restrictions clause. So, the right to freedom of speech um, may be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only be such as provided in law, so it has to be set out in legislation or policy, and it has to be necessary for one of two aims, either respect of rights or reputations of others, or protection of national security, public order, public health, morals. Um, so what's interesting about this is that it gives a little bit more leeway. There's not necessarily the obligation for states to prohibit, to prosecute, to criminalize. However, restriction gives us a little bit more room to play in terms of we can also look at preventative measures, we can soft law measures, like there's a lot more room and I think that it's just in general quite an interesting provision to look at. Um, specifically in the protection of, of, of free speech and how important that is. We don't want to disproportionately restrict it or violate it. Um, so I'm interested in this article's use. So uh, then the question comes into with hate speech and where, where regulation lies. Because we don't have a definition of hate speech in international law, we also don't have in international law the actual prohibition of hate speech. We have the clause on inciting speech, which, which overlaps, of course. Uh, and we have Article 19.3, which if you look at the respect of the rights and reputation of others, overlaps, but 
we're kind of still grasping at straws here in general before we get to gender identity. Um, so Elena set out a lot of nice things. I kind of had it that I wasn't going to speak too much about the actual definition of hate speech because I'm luckily in this uh, this conference and everyone's going to provide probably much better illustrations. So I'll work just with I kind of in the paper was talking about more from a relation to discrimination. So uh, publications which express profound disrespect, hatred, vilification of members of a minority group um, or a discursive act of discrimination. You often have the concept words that wound that actually they discriminate through the speech. Um, it violates the basic human dignity of its victims. Um, Matsuda was the first person, as far as I understand, to denoted it in academic literature to refer specifically to racist hate speech. The criteria there is that the speech denotes, uh, denotes inferiority. It's against a historically oppressed group or group member, and it is persecutory, hateful, or degrading. Um, so the thing that I was interested in, in contrasting at least, is that uh, whether we look at the international law provisions or we just think about it a bit more logically, a lot of hate speech, um, say against Jewish people or black people, so racist hate speech or anti-Semitic hate speech, it's, it's targeting people on that basis, right? What I'm interested in is that for trans people, for people based on their non-normative gender identities, they have to suffer not only being targeted by the hate speech, but then in the same breath, kind of being questioned their existence. So compared to if somebody is targeted for being Jewish, there's no question whether being Jewish, Jewish is a legitimate thing, is a real aspect of their identity. The religion is sorted. There's all the personal aspects of your religion, your religious practice, your, your cultural um, heritage. But for what I'll talk about now, trans people really bear this double burden of being targeted for who they are, but then also questioned if they really exist. Um, so consider why do we have protection on some grounds and, and not others. Um, yeah, and then I just wanted to mention, it wasn't in the slides, but the United Nations has this strategy and plan of action on hate speech. And in this, they do say um, gender or ever, um, any other identity factor. So there is room for us to get gender identity written down and, and enforced or developed on, but that's kind of the basis that I'm, I'm at. So just to talk a little bit more about this um, and actually how it's operating and how we can consider it. And this is some of the stuff I'd love some feedback on because yeah, there's also quite a lot, like quite a lack of data comparatively to other discrimination and hate speech. Um, but yeah, so when we talk about hate speech against people based on their non-normative gender identities or hate speech against trans people, some of the causes and context. So um, I'm South African. I like to always talk about colonization. I'm interested in its impact on us and how we've we've come to regard people as people and how it's done. So colonization, um, I wanted to just find my notes, sorry, um, really didn't necessarily create the gender binary, but really, really enforced it and made it probably more successful than it had ever been. We do know, and there's increasing and coverage of history that gender diversity has been around forever that pre-colonial communities and societies had extensive gender plurality, diversity. There were all sorts of, there are all sorts of people and have always been some people that are two-spirit, that are non-binary, that have different terms. English is also quite limiting in this description. Um, so yeah, we have to consider colonization and decolonization. And then when people start to represent um, and advocate now, there is often seen that this is a new phenomenon, right? Um, but people have always existed in their plurality and it's it's an interesting thing that from a lack of education on it, a lack of awareness, from hiding parts of history, we think that this is the new thing and it isn't. Um, so then also the impact of religious heteronormativity, um, this is linked to colonization, specifically Christianity and Islam, um, and the gender roles, the sexual roles, um, it also links to normative nuclear families. So we might feel how does a trans person operate if we see that society is organized by these perfect nuclear families, one dad, one mom, and children. This, this questions that, right? This can threaten that um, for people. And so people can feel targeted in their, their understanding of how the world works, how it should work. Um, sorry, so these family oriented cultures, we see this a lot in certain countries. They advocate that gender ideology, 
teaching of queer issues, LGBT issues, transgenderism being something even discussed is going to get their children to, I don't know, like um, no longer have a gender. I don't know, no longer. There's, there's all sorts of interesting things online and in publication and we can get into this a bit further. Um, so yeah, so often this is how it operates. Trans people are seen as mentally ill. We have a long history of both internationally, um, in the international classification of diseases and related health problems, we also had um, uh, homosexuality classified as a mental illness, and then transsexualism was, it is now developed, then it was in um, gender dysphoria, which was the thing I mentioned a little bit earlier, if your birth sex and your gender, gender identity aren't the same, that would be the dysphoria, but how it's been described in a lot of medical journals is that this distress or this, so that's also what leads to conversion therapy, where somebody is wrong, they're in distress, we can fix them. Um, we've now developed it into describing it as gender incongruence, which is kind of what I was talking about, is we're just recognizing that your birth sex and your gender identity don't align, but then there's no normative comment of if that's good or bad. We're just recognizing that it exists in people. Um, yeah, and uh, we see this a lot that um, trans people are seen as frauds, um, are seen as sexual predators. A lot of the notions of the bathroom debates, of how people uh, will identify on their passports, having the correct gender markers. It's basically just a lot of it is questioned as whether it, or not it's legitimate, right? Which within anti-discrimination protections is, is quite a new thing, I think. People on the basis of their sexual orientation have had to and still continue to deal with this, but you can separate, arguably, some people think you could separate the person from, say, their relationship or their sexual practices or their sexual orientation, but how do you separate someone from their gender identity, right? It's part of their identity. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, people are seen as a joke and trans people, and, and the media has perpetuated this a lot. Um, the man in a dress trope, specifically for transgender women who are arguably more visible, they're also then more, um, I would say, vulnerable to discrimination, to hate speech, to being targeted. Um, and then that also opts into that it's just a debate, it's just a joke, it's up for discussion. If a person dresses that way, I can say what I want, et cetera, et cetera. So where do we draw the line then when that is inciting speech against discrimination, sexual assault against these people? Um, so yeah, so the thing that I'm interested in is that Transgender people are often regarded as a villain, as a predator or threat, as mentally ill or a joke, but then they are not regarded as human beings or protected legal subjects. They, if you think about non-binary people and the discussions that are happening there, we understand even legal treaties are set out that he, like all people and he shall, she shall, if we ever got that. But what if somebody is a they? How do we, how do we recognize and protect their legal rights? They are human beings, but if they're not linked to their normative gender, we don't really know what to do with them. Um, so this, this lack of legal recognition, legal subjectivity, personhood, the fact that human dignity and human identity seems to be tied to your normative gender identity. If none of us had genders and we were just human beings, how would we associate legal protections? Our, our world is gendered. Um, and I, I'm interested in how we, I don't know, we better teach us, we look at it and we protect it. So um, I think that the recognition of, of human beings as rights bearers entitled to non-discrimination not based on their gender identity, their race, their religion, any of these things. I want to know why, like, we've seen it, obviously, with, say, racism through the years, that people of color were also denied their humanity. They were dehumanized for many, many, many years. And I, I'm wondering about the, the similarities in how we do this as society and what international human rights law can do for us, um, in a sense. So... Just to speak a little bit, anti-trans sentiment or hate speech against trans people, hate speech based on gender identity, it operates differently in different contexts. Um, this is, I, I did quite a bit of work about um, the African regional human rights system. That was my master's thesis. And as an example, this conflation of gender identity and sexual orientation has life-threatening consequences for trans people in many African countries. So if you look at the context that we still have criminalization um, of same-sex sexual conduct, uh, conduct in, in 32 African countries currently, with a lack of awareness of these issues, um, any so-called deviant femini femininity can be criminalized. So um, a lot of these laws focus on, and, um, on homosexual men, 
and uh, with a lack of recognition, awareness, transgender women are doubly persecuted. So hate speech is viewed against them, they are criminalized, they can go to jail for just maybe dressing how they do. They don't even have to engage in sexual conduct. Um, and it's, it's really dire because trans people, are, trans women in that instance are then being discriminated against, but not even properly. Like if you look through some of the Facebook feeds, if you look at some of the things that have been happening, say in Ghana recently in Nigeria, um, these trans women say are, are persecuted, hate speech is spewed against them, there is violence against them on the basis they're gay men. They're not even gay men and we have such a lack of awareness of the intricacies of human identity, but they are, they are suffering for it, right? Um, and this links just to dehumanization. Um, Facebook again, you know, the I don't know, the, the way that people are spoken about, okay, if we allow people to identify as trans, what's next? We're going to give rights to turtles. Like, it's bizarre animalistic speak that we would never really allow in other contexts, say on race or religion, but gender seems to be up for, for debate. Um, and then in the global north, in, in countries like America or um, Europe, there's been arguably a lot more uh, development in national contexts of protection against discrimination, hate speech, uh, hate crimes for, for queer people in general, for LGBT people, um, for trans people, but then there's been this massive backlash. And so we've seen this a lot in the context in some of the Eastern European countries. Um, we see this in the States. And as I spoke a little bit earlier, there's this, uh, they're trying this, this moral conspiracy panic theory. They're trying to undermine the family structure. They're trying to abolish all religion. They're trying to take away our morality, like all this panic. Um, and what I find interesting about the two different contexts here, say, is that often, the argument is we have our national context, we have our national morality, religion, culture, and they are coming to destroy it. This is said in Africa, this is said in Europe. Uh, it's a fascinating, there's actually a lot of links there. Um, and then, yeah, there's the deprivation of legal protection. So if somebody doesn't have the correct gender markers on their identity, if they're trying to travel in their passport and they are not the same, um, the ways that they are treated, I mean, yeah, it's, it's horrific and it's, it almost emboldens, I would say, hate speech and, and deprives them of this recognition. And so this then links to incitement to violence, justification of hate crimes. Um, and then I, I mentioned this a bit earlier, but the contrast with anti-gay speech and we have protection for, we have increasing protection, I would say, on hate speech based on sexual um, orientation. But again, there are some arguments that you then could separate targeting someone based on their actions and and people have to say it's like I have no problem with this person or it wasn't against them it was against their behavior their relationship their this but but we don't really have the same leeway for for trans people because it is fundamentally who they are so thinking about gender identity as a protected ground against hate speech um, in my paper I wrote a little bit more about stuff that's happened on the UN level we have the independent expert on SOGI he's got these two reports that just came out that have been very very useful um, and then in the, in the regional human rights systems, the three regional human rights systems. So I would say at home, we're a little bit further behind, but at least in the African regional human rights system in 2014, we had resolution 275. It's, it's soft law and it kind of just recognizes that discrimination is bad in general. And then it identifies that people based on their real or imputed sexual orientation or gender identity are at a bigger risk. So it's kind of a statement there that some countries have been working with, but it's, it's soft. And then in the inter-American system, I mean, they've done a bit more. A lot of the countries there actually have relatively good recognition, acknowledgement of the precarious position trans people are in. Um, but in, as an example, also in 2015, they, had, they have a statement, quite a good one, regarding hate speech specifically targeting LGBTIQ people and then recognizing what this does for trans people. And then in Europe, we've got probably the most literature to work with um, and instruments to work with. But then obviously we see, as I'm talking about the backlash and how do we kind of make it stop being up for debate. Um, and then, yeah, some countries have, have um, outright criminalized it or acknowledged it. So as an example, Norway was just the one that I mentioned, but in late 2020, they extended their penal code. So kind of operating through the Article 22 prohibition, they've made it a crime um, to have hate speech against transgender people. What I'm interested in though is, and it was kind of mentioned earlier, I'm not always sure that criminalizing hate speech is necessarily going to achieve the aim that we want in building tolerance, awareness. If you punish people for these 
arguably uh, for these horrific beliefs statements i'm not sure that that's going to you know build bridges so something i think about um and so yeah so from an international human rights law guidance perspective article 22 has these three grounds i get where it comes from the development i'm not sure that that i would necessarily advocate for and gender identity like incitement to discrimination based on gender identity is necessarily where we're going to go because we've got all these other barriers so to speak to just even getting people acknowledged to be legitimate human beings and legal subjects so i'm more interested in using article 19 3a um, to develop the recognition that all human beings have their inherent dignity notwithstanding any defining personality feature and everyone is entitled to the right to non-discrimination so then by virtue of that hate speech against any person is really bad but as long as we also are having this contentiousness of are trans people even legitimate what are their like what is their conspiracy like what are, what are they trying to undo to society as opposed to just letting them live their lives i just i'm thinking about kind of developing this. so i've got a couple of problems um that maybe will be uh brought up through the questions and answers but yeah i just think that if we could recognize gender identity as a protected ground against hate speech that would also give us a, a basis then to move forward as a society so that when this happens we actually have a legal basis for trans people to be recognized protected and to further their aim of just being allowed to live in peace and protected so that's where i am thank you very much for listening i really appreciate it and um yeah thank you tegan um that was a very very interesting talk about a very interesting topic and um in a manner also a very innovative talking um as you refer to during your, your presentation there are issues that are still developing in 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 that uh context of gender identity uh let me just note that if anyone wants to ask a question please uh, either use the raise hand feature or write it in the q a uh, feature of zoom so we'll know to give you the floor um when when I read your paper and listened to your very interesting presentation. I had kind of, um, how do I say it? It's like we're, it's kind of a circle that we don't know where it begins and where it ends because we have the problem of the actual definition of gender identity, which is a problem uh, with many states, as you mentioned in, in your paper. And at the same time, if we don't define something, how can we uh, prohibit hate speech against it? And, and then I think we are not, unfortunately, of course, haven't developed enough in the definition of gender identity within states to expect them to have a good hate speech uh, prohibition against, uh, ag against those people. And as, as, when I kept reading your paper and also uh, I kept going back to the notion of microaggression more than the notion of hate speech, because I think that the paper can be wider than it is right now. And if you just narrow it down to hate speech, you have a big problem of, well, you know, you start with definitions. And the definition section is important, but it also jumps over the problem of, well, that definition is the problem that we have, um, it, it, both in international law and uh, comparative law. And that's a big problem that we have. And I think within your paper, section four is the heart of your paper, right? It's where you actually develop the entire concept of hate speech. And I think, um, you touch a lot of aspects there from the uh, historical and colonialist aspects, but also the, the legal developments. And I think um, currently the paper is written and, and it took me a while to get, to put my finger on it. I think it's written more in the context of uh, UN report where, you know, you're, touching the the, 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 point, the relevant points, but you can actually develop them much further. And especially in that context of the lack of development of the gender identity, there's a lot 
to write about, which would lead you to a stronger place on the hate speech. Um, having said that, I'm not sure that it is necessarily a hate speech paper per se, because the problem is bigger. Hate speech as a problem in that context. And as I said, microaggression for me right now is a much bigger problem in that context because of the examples you gave, because of, well, it's a religious, it's a religious problem. It's not gender identity problem. It's just a joke. It's a man in a dress. It's like, God, I didn't mean it. It was a joke. I didn't know. I wasn't aware of that, that it is even a problem, which are all the basic definitions of what microaggressions uh, is all about, which goes and expand the bigger problem, which kind of, uh, when, when I'm trying to think about it and when I'm trying to articulate what I think about it more likely, is it is a separate lane to hate speech. Hate speech is usually, as Gadi defined it uh, very nicely earlier, it's much stronger and, and it's going to lead to uh, have a much stronger effect and not every prohibited speech is necessarily hate speech and not every hate speech is criminal speech should be uh, criminally prohibited. And microaggression on the other hand, goes along the side of that completely. It's not prohibited. It's not uh, meant to harm anyone directly. You don't think you harm anyone when you do it. And eventually the outcome is as awful, um, but you don't, you can't pinpoint it. So um, I would think, Section four of your article can be expanded in that in that relevance in order to and include hate speech within it, but not necessarily um, as it is right now. It, it it feels that there is a logical jump between well we know that gender is a, uh, gender identity is an issue, we know that this is a population that suffers from hate speech, but we cannot overcome that gap of how to define hate speech good enough in order to prohibit it as we stand at the moment. So this is uh, my, my, main, uh, my main point. And I would also, as I said, it reminds more of a, a special repertoire uh, report because you need to also expand some of the theoretical uh, background of that development and also the historical, um, which were all, all, which are all there, but should be uh, expanded. And and you see that in section four, you go more into the theory than in the other sections as well. So build it uh, in a more structural way would lead you in in, in a, to a very very interesting uh, discussion, which you already have there, but can be much uh, better also for publications later on. Um, Okay, I think we're gonna give uh, Carolina the floor and then you'll be able to respond either to me or her. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tegan. Thank you so much for um, super informative and interesting presentation and um, touching on so many important issues. And I imagine that there were even more that, he, he, you know, if we had time, we could have covered. Um, so I appreciate that it had to be narrowed down. Um, and since Ido mentioned the problems with, with defining it, I was wondering if we could talk also about the absence of linguistic recognition as one of the contexts of um, anti-trans sentiment that you, you mentioned a few uh, of those contexts. And I was wondering if we could add that linguistic dimension uh, to it. Um, I'm thinking about a few examples. Obviously there's the issue of uh, recognizing correct pronouns um, and, um, well, the English language that, that we are operating in obviously has um, found a sort of way for it. Um, the use of the pronoun they is really interesting in, in, the, in the past sort of two generations, more or less, it went from being only plural to being an impersonal pronoun as well. And now it's also a, an option for, um, for example, non-binary people if they choose to use it. Um, but English is probably unusual in that. I mean, not every language has that recognition yet, hopefully. Um, hopefully yet, and hopefully will. Um, and another example is, for example, the gendered nouns for 
jobs uh, and other positions. Again, uh, English has a variety in, in the sense that we can have professor for every person, but for example, we used to have policemen and now that there is a shift towards uh, not saying policeman, policewoman for those two genders, but having police officer for all genders. But again, not every language will have that. Um, a lot of languages we here represent a lot of languages. So all of us can think of examples, I'm sure. For example, in Spanish, you, there might be there might be endings for uh, male or female, but not not necessary for a non-binary person again. Um, and um, that that in uh, again other languages it, that might refer also to verbs, not just nouns and so on. So not to go into detail, um, but through that we can identify an absence of that language um, and sometimes. Um, deliberate misuse of that language and I think that could add to that definition of possibly developing it and I'm mentioning this because the language not only reflects uh, our reality as we know it also shapes our reality and there are precedents in um, the area for example of language around immigration where changing that language in policies and campaigning to change that language in um, legal language has helped integration, for example, in the US, I, I can't think of the name of the study, but I can find it if anyone's interested, but there have been studies on how changing the language from calling um, uh, immigrants um, aliens or uh, illegal immigrants to undocumented um, has helped um, integration of immigrants in, in communities. So perhaps this is, this is one of the, um, avenues we can look at when when um, recognizing um, uh, yeah recognizing other um, groups social groups that need that recognition in uh, the legal context um, I don't know if there's space for this in your paper um, at this moment or perhaps you've already considered this um, but it, uh, yeah that's something that um, came to mind thank you again would you like to respond yeah, so just quickly. So first, Ida, with um, your comment as well, and I'm really grateful for yeah what you brought up. The other thing I was struggling with a little bit with the development of Section 4, but maybe when I have time now, is a lot of the, say, um, the reports that document, say, human rights violations of hate speech, um, they do this thing of anti-LGBT hate speech, right? And where it's like, there's no necessarily data statistics of like how much on... Um, social media or in publications or whatever is it like anti-gay and anti-trans right like the separation so a lot of it ends up being like anti-lgbt speech but it's like homophobic instances that oh, homophobic hate speech instances and publications on social media that gets kind of documented and that was i was struggling a little bit with that access to data but it's it's very interesting and then uh, and thank you for your points i'll i made some notes and that's really good for me to think about um, and then carolina is yeah thank you very much and also this is one of the things I don't know if it came across, but and that's the thing with Section 22 as an example and the rabbit plan of action and, and criminalizing speech or making hate speech legally actionable is this this intention or this deliberate this deliberate to to the speech because that's what I was also wondering like where do you draw the line because misgendering someone as an example I mean there's worse obviously but you know sometimes people just do it and like I don't know the level of intention which is also what I was saying about the microaggressions this is part of a bigger thing um and that is hard it, with the lack of information that people have a lack of awareness in general um but the linguistic thing is very very interesting and that was also the terminology that we've come up with in English and that's developed is also quite far behind say pre-colonial cultures and other cultures and other languages um but it's something I'll very much think about so yeah thank you very much both of you Elena, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tegan, for really, really interesting presentation. And uh, I really welcome also your all your reference to the contextual elements to, to the hate speech and really, uh, in a way, talks to, to, to my paper before. Um, uh, I, I agree with Ido in the sense that this is like definitely a, a broader uh, debate than just simply on hate speech and like the inclusion of gender identity within the categories for uh, protected from discrimination. So I think like your paper really uh, uh, fills some gaps, but also is part of a broader picture that you, you may also uh, want to expand more in, in your next draft of the paper. But I just wanted to uh, flex 
few things. Uh, one is that, I mean, you say like, yeah, there is a lot of things to do to include gender identity as a category a collective from hate speech. But uh, I don't know if you had the chance, but if you look at the um, community guidelines of Facebook or the, the um, guidelines for, for YouTube and Twitter, all of them, they include gender identity as a category uh, for um, a protected category against hate speech. So uh, when it comes to their content moderation uh, practices, they, they do consider gender identity specifically as one of the protected category. So maybe it would be interesting to see what's the application of this so in those cases online we see that they include gender identity they do uh but then what about the application in practice gender identity is really protected or only remain something in in um in the letter written down but then doesn't have a follow-up because this is what sometimes happens i mean uh, i i believe your the point of your paper is not just to to add the gender identity part as you said like there's not like uh, the point is not to just have a gender identity added to uh, what discrimination is about, it's more like giving meaning to that. So maybe as a case study or as a further analysis, I don't know, for this paper or for a next paper, it would be interesting to see uh, in that case where we do have gender identity listed as protected category, what happens in practice. Um, and also, I'm really um, uh, happy you mentioned the role of regional human rights systems that I think they're doing great. And I, I think you could reflect more on how, I mean, I, you know, you, you um, uh, say that the 2015 um, uh, declaration of the Inter-American System on uh, um, Hate Speech and LGBTI um, groups is soft law, it's true, but of course, all those regional systems have courts that issue binding judgments for states. So, it, I mean, they do have a power of not, not just like you know, from a soft law perspective of influencing the activity of the states, but also uh, this, I mean, this kind of soft law documents could encourage litigation before the courts. They could in turn um, uh, lead to binding judgments that will uh, ensure that uh, national uh, laws are, are changed. So maybe you can also uh, reflect more on that on the paper, uh, but also at the same time, uh, I don't know if it's your field of expertise and, and you're interested in that, but of course I foresee that within the European uh, um, Court of Human Rights uh, system, then we, we will uh, um, have in front of us like the margin of appreciation uh, that has been used by the court in a lot of cases concerning gender identity as well. So I think here there will be another barrier on how uh, um, the European Court of Human Rights will deal with uh, and whether they will, you will use or not and invoke the margin of appreciation not to uh, uh, rule ultimately on, on things related to uh, hate speech and gender identity considering everything you said about all the values and cultural element and religious element that may play a role in this, but really, really interesting paper. Yeah, you want to comment? Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for that insight. Your last point, I'm, I'm very much on board with your first point about the community guidelines. It's a bit of a problem also with my PhD because I actually don't have social media. And I know a lot of the focus on hate speech is the, the practical implications with online. And um, I actually don't have that. And I am a bit old school, like looking at, you know, laws and in practice and theoretically. And so I need to get on board with that. But I'm, I'm very grateful you made me aware of the community guidelines. And um, no, it's a very important because of the practicalities. I mean, that impacts people's lives more than, than we know. So yeah, thank you very much. Eva, please. Thank you, and thank you so much, Tegan. Uh, it's it's been a pleasure to read your paper, and congratulations for even working on something beyond the key research plan. It's it's impressive. Um, so yeah, I think um, some of my comments, yeah, essentially the the B comment uh, also follows a bit the line of uh, perhaps strengthening a bit the legal argument of how to expand this inter interpretation of what 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 are the protected categories to be able to include um, trans people. And I guess what came to my mind um, was potentially the same way that we have an evolutive approach in the European, in, uh, the European um, human rights context, there could be an argument for a similar treaty interpretation um, for, for the, the, EU, the, yeah, the international human rights uh, instruments. I think um, there's been a paper that has made this claim, but more to the death penalty 
um, context, but perhaps that could be something that could strengthen also your argument on how to interpret these clauses. Um, and of course, that also made me think about the data and what you just mentioned that it was not very easy to get disaggregated data on um, the increasing prevalence of, of hate towards trans people, but perhaps you could get in touch with ILGO or I, I don't know, some, some associations that could really strengthen because I, I imagine that even for you to make this legal claim, you would, you know, the evolutive approach of what it is that should be interpreted as protected categories in our in our day to day. What are the the, the strength and the fights that, uh, yeah, people are are uh, fighting for these days? Um, it would it would really help, um, even as just as an introductory point, but making the case for the legal interpretation. Um, but I, I empathize that it is it is a struggle to get disaggregated data. Um, but yeah, good luck, and I think it's worth it. Um, and um, also, um, perhaps that could also be, yeah, that could also strengthen your, your paper, um, trying to understand. So you've mentioned Matsuda and the original work um, of how hate speech came to be uh, as opposed to racism. Um, but also within that framework uh, of, of critical theory, intersectionality, that's also, um, a sociological element that could strengthen the legal ele element, um, because even in the light of their framework, uh, even though that was the original uh, um, interpretation, uh, as per the principles of non hierarchy and all that um, that that follow uh, that that support critical theory and intersectionality, there's also room for for you to build on that. I think um, and. Yes, I was also thinking, and that's perhaps more linked to what um, Elena just mentioned about the, the case studies. Even, even if you're not strictly focusing on social media, um, perhaps there, there are, yeah, there's jurisprudence where you could try to understand. And, and now that, that's more related to the Vienna Convention and treaty interpretation. So I don't know if there's current practices between certain states that could already support your your argument. So, you know, thinking about, yeah, instruments. So, uh, yeah, Article 31 uh, be, let's say, if they have different instruments um, amongst themselves. So, there's, there's perhaps, um, yeah, something, something to explore there um, using the Vienna Convention and, and um, yeah, state practice. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for this. Yeah, please. No, I don't think I have anything else to say, but thanks, Eva. I appreciate it. And um, yeah. We'll chat about it in the future. So thanks. Martin. Thank you. Thank you for, for the paper. It was interesting for me to to read. So I'm not really an expert as I'm a social scientist. I'm not really an expert in this debate um, you are leading there. But um, I when I come to read about your section on normativity, I that reminded me on debates we have in in norms research in social science where we often use the discrimination of descriptive norms and injunctive norms uh, with injunctive norms being what you understand with normativity which means uh, something that should be in a certain way oughtness or something while descriptive norms or, or quantitative norms are just a, a recognition of majorities and maybe there was one statement you made that uh, in in societies cisgender people are still considered by many to be the norm then maybe this is not based on this injunctive norm understanding uh, that uh, transgender people might be um, lower value people, but just from a quantitative or descriptive perspective that uh, they're just a small minority. And arguments like that very often appear in debates, for example, about gender language um, and so on, where people say, is it really necessary that such a small group uh, shall dominate the debate and things like that? So uh, I just wondered whether this, this distinction between these uh, injunctive descriptive norms is a category in your, in your, um, from your uh, legal, uh, legal perspective. And maybe it's just a second remark that is not maybe not relevant for you, but maybe for others 
um, uh, in our panel is uh, that I found interesting your analysis of um, these frame framings of um, of uh, gender identities because to my impression this field of transgender hate speech may be one where not so many established stereotypes are existing compared to, I don't know, racist uh, uh, stereotypes or anti-Semitic um, stereotypes and so on. So for me, one conclusion would be that particularly dealing with an issue like yours, um, it would be relevant maybe to to prevent at the very beginning of a debate uh, the establishment of stereotypes, which in the end may may lower the the need for uh, for developing strong laws against um, against hate speech. But that's just an an idea and may just lead to research projects in, in analyzing stereotypes, hate speech stereotypes and uh, public debate. Uh, I think we can take also Giovanni. Yeah, hi all, good morning. And thank you so much for, I mean, for this presentation and just, you know, uh, also reading the draft, you know, this end of your paper. Um, this is a very quick and straight question. You know, I'm wondering whether uh, you can think about uh, using more comparative studies, you know, just to analyze what is happening at the mem, I mean, not at the member states level in the EU, but also, you know, around the world. I mean, uh, for example, recently, uh, not because I'm Italian for sure, but because in Italy there have been a huge debate about the, uh, the DDL ZAN, you know, there was the anti discrimination law. Again. So that is actually been a huge debate because the parliament has actually rejected the bill, you know, at the very end. So, um, there's been a huge debate about what we can consider like hate speech or discrimination, or whether we need a precise law probably to regulate this thing. Probably not because it's general about hate speech. So, I mean, it would be interesting also to support you, to support your, your analysis with the, what actually states are doing, because at the very end, this problem concerns the enforcement of this rule at national level, you know. And the other point that I would like to raise is that I think also that um, it's also interesting to look at also the way in which uh, states relate to international law, because sometimes, yes, we can say that discrimination is a value that can be, you know, condemned or is part, it's already included in the field of international law, but we know at the same time that even huge countries in the world are not so much open to international law. And so this could be a very big limit in terms of uh, thinking about uh, extending the boundaries of hate speech to this framework, you know, but I totally agree with you with your with your idea about thinking about gender within the frame of international law, but the question is about what happens when I go before a court and see, you know, whether my rights are protected or not. So thank you so much, by the way, you know. Uh, I can just say, yeah, thanks to both of you, Giovanni. Yeah, thank you for that point. And I think that has now been echoed by a couple of people, which I'm grateful for. And I think that was just maybe time constraints. But there's a lot, there's a, a couple of different things that overlap that need to be expanded on to also illustrate the, the practicalities and the urgency of this and what's happening in countries and things like that. That's great. And, and Martin, very much the normativity distinction or description that's very interesting. I wasn't exactly aware of that. That's, that's news to me, but that's, I think, because it's, not my focus it's kind of the add-ons that i get through certain things so that'll be really nice to to make that distinction yeah so thank you very much to both of you sonia please thank you <clears throat> yeah tegan thank you very much for your interesting and very relevant um paper um i was just um I just have a brief comment on something I thought uh, was really interesting that you touched on in your presentation, and that is uh, your observation that transgender people are uh, denied um, their existence in, in some um, um, uh, patterns of, of speech. And that reminded me of something that we found in a, in a project I was working on until uh, last October, and that was a project on hate speech in online discussions um, on the subject of immigration and refuge. And there we find um, a similar pattern um, that um, refugees were um, denied their existence by, for example, people stating that um, they are not really 
real refugees or just putting the, the words refugees in quotation marks, for example, or calling them like inventing um, um, words such as refugee actors, for example. So obviously then in German, but so um, we also had this um, empirical observation in regarding this, this uh, group um, targeted by hate speech. And I found this uh, really interesting. And I was wondering whether um, this is something um, you could um, develop or I don't know um, what um, to do with these um, sort of speech then because uh, we kind of had this struggle as well um, where to put it in our category, category system when, when analyzing the, the discussion, the online discussions we, we did in the project. So Yeah, that, that's a really, really good point. Thank you very much. And also <clears throat> I can imagine, and this is something I'm sure you would relate to is like, the uh, nationality and um, state be stateless persons also like their their existence and their legal subjectivity how they're able to be recognized and protected as a whole thing but this the skepticism thing which you do see a lot of and assuming the worst of people or malintention to destroy your nation your culture your religion blah 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 that yes i assume uh, I, that makes a lot of sense that refugees also experience a very similar descriptive approach um, than as trans people do. So thank you for raising that, yeah. Uh, I see that we have a couple of more minutes, so I want to go uh, to add another issue to, to, to the discussion. Uh, I think that the notion of the trans uh, tra transgender and the gender identity raises a very interesting question about where would the discussion about hate speech should come from. Should it come from the states or should it come from the field? Should it come from the organizations, the uh, human rights organizations or other, or other organizations? Uh, should it come from states? Should it come from the UN and its experts? Uh, what level of discussion would be most suited to develop that kind of definitions on the one hand? And the prohibitions on hate speech and, and other uh, types of, of uh, prohibited speech or, or limitations with regard to that. And I don't have an answer to that. I, I think it would be interesting to take advantage of this uh, workshop panel to see if there are any uh, thoughts and ideas, because I think it also relates to uh, Elena's presentations uh, in a way. What, I, what is the right way to, to develop? And, and because we're talking about gender identity, because we said it's still early in the process of defining, it's on that sense, it's a very interesting test case to see how things should be developed. So any thoughts from, from you, Tegan, or anyone else on the panel are very welcome on, on that issue. No, I think it's a great question. Does anyone have insight to help? Yes, Leon. I believe that uh, definitions of hate speech are best achieved at the national level, as it is the uh, nation state that uh, grants the provisions on free speech in its constitution normally. And that um, for that reason, the limitations on free speech and what sorts of uh, conduct are acceptable or not are best, um, are best set at the uh, national level in accordance with uh, international law, international treaties that uh, the respective states, nation states have entered into, or at least that's my opinion. Eva? Um, to me, it should be the victims telling us um, what it is that they're suffering, what sort of, what sort of speech is hurtful for them. And, um, and I think that should be, yeah, that should be the starting point. Uh, similarly to what Tegan just introduced with Matsuda. So hate speech originally came about with critical race theory. 
but it was because they were scholars uh, who were witnessing um, hate speech themselves. So they themselves, they were victim, well, survivors. Um, um, so yeah, that would be my my starting point. But of course, that's not that's not the holy grail for 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 how that translate that into legal action. But and we would need to understand, of course. Um, yeah, how to interpret human rights into mm -hmm. national um, national legislation, but also the, the yeah constitutionals. But but for me, the starting point would always be um, yeah the victims' perspective. Um, if I can respond to Leon, the the problem I have with with your response is, and I think this is always the case with international human rights law and and states and the concept of state sovereignty and for a state to be able to do the stuff for itself, I mean, that also can defeat the, the function of international human rights law, because then a state can just opt out, and we see them do this all the time, like, it can be like, ah, oh, it's against our culture, our religion, our blah, 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 and I mean, I'm from South Africa, like, we're okay with this, but on the continent, we see some horrific stuff get justified by a state sovereignty, uh, so what is the function then, like, how can international law be a collaborative effort of whatever I mean, I know it's very airy fairy for a lot of people what international law can even do because of this, like, states have to opt in and consent and stuff like that. So that's the only thing that I struggle with with that, because then you just have to hope that all states are actually going to. So I think it's always conceptual for me, coming back to dignity, like everybody has dignity, their inherent human dignity. How do we operationalize that? And then non-discrimination. And that was why I said, like, you know, as a ground of protection for non-discrimination, because I'm like, I see protection against hate speech as part and parcel of discrimination against protection in more generally, right? Which is what Ida was also saying about the microaggressions and protection of people and stuff. So I'm always, now that I'm thinking about it, I said it didn't have an answer. I'm often like, you know, a debate or discussion in the UN and then like you could have, I don't know, a declaration put out. And that's why I really like kind of the work of the independent experts and stuff, but states can still opt out of that. That, uh, that is like, I think we're always gonna have that problem. Um, and Eva's part is also really good, but or, or just and um, I mean we see this still with racism we see this still with anti-semitism and like all sorts of discrimination like we can listen to targets of these things but I don't know it's always like I don't know them as a minority being being othered to be the I don't know like I don't know if, if focusing always on on the specific targeting of them or just more like the, the general basis of everyone has dignity I mean it sounds silly like everyone should be nice to each other no one should because the other thing is like ever the way you described it, you know, the, the words they found hurtful or harmful, there is offensive speech, right? What you said is not actionable hate speech always. And like, it gets very, this comes back to the definition and the, and the, the need to, I think, um, declare it to define it and make it a bit more scope wise. But um, yeah. Elena. Sorry if I jump in, but uh, this debate is so so interesting uh and in a way to like reconcile tegan eva and, and leon uh point out think that like all of you are, are are correct and i agree with all of you somehow but because i think i mean it's probably a continued dialogue that is needed here and there's where multi-stakeholder approach is needed and some, i know that sometimes we say multi-stakeholder approach as the solution to everything and it doesn't mean uh, nothing we're here it actually means a lot like i think we as Eva said, we need to hear the people who suffer from these uh, aggressions, microaggression or major aggression, they could be, or hate speech as such, to understand what's the problem. But then it's up to the state, because it's the state that act, you know, like, uh, will, will enact laws, it's up to the state to uh, uh, include them within the framework of international human rights law. So using international human rights law as this kind of like, um, in a way, platonic, ideal regulatory idea of where do we need to I mean, the direction we need to, to head toward um, and then like regulate the subject and, and understand whether uh, the the claim that we hear from the people who are suffering is uh, specific to them or should be generalized to a group or a category or what else should be done so i think here is a i mean and hate speech is one of the big examples where we need to have all the different uh, uh stakeholders involved in different stages but in, in different capacities and i think like here these uh, the transformative universality idea of diane otto finds perfect uh, um, uh, place in this 
continue dialogue with everyone and every voice, even the, those uh, uh, unheard voices in the past that should uh, have a voice now to being able to inform both our universal uh, idea of we need to fight against hate speech, but also the more localized and, and contextualized uh, provisions for making it happen. Very, very interesting question and debate. Okay, um, I think our time is basically up for this discussion. I think, Tegan, you have a lot of uh, interesting uh, input out of that discussion. I think the whole notion of gender identity is so important on the one hand, and it's so early and it stages on the other hand, too early, uh, too premature, I'm not too premature, but it should be developed and it can be developed so much so that addressing that topic is a very, very interesting uh, thing to do. Uh, I think um, it's gonna go to very, very interesting output at the end of the world. And I actually look forward to read the other, the other part of the developed uh, paper that we will see in the second part of the workshop a few months ahead. I wanna thank you again, uh, Tingan, for your presentation. And again, we're going to take a couple of minutes, uh, actually a 10 minutes break and reconvene again. Thank you. Thanks everyone for the feedback. I, I, I needed it and I, I really appreciate it. I've been operating in a silo on this, this paper because it's separate from the PhD. So thanks very much.